Well, good morning. My name is Alex Rosa, and I'm our lead pastor here at New Life. And as these guys have a seat, I just want to also, as Pastor Kristen already said, thank you so much for coming today. If you are here for the first time to support a family member, thank you so much for doing that, for, for them, for their sake, and for, for joining us. We appreciate the fact that you are here today. No matter what brought you here, if you are a first-time guest, I want you to know that we've been praying and planning for your arrival today and are just so thankful that you've decided to invest some of your time here. Before we get into the message, we want to honor the veterans that are among us. I know we had a video earlier in the service, but what I'd like to do is, if you're willing, and you served in any branch of the military in any capacity, would you please right now stand so we can just thank you for your service and for your sacrifice. (laughs) While you're standing... I'd love to just pray for you and for your loved ones as well. Dear God, I thank you so much for the men and women right now that are in our midst that have sacrificed for you and for this country. Pray that you will pour out blessings on their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Pray that you also protect and bless those that are in active military duty all over the world right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you very much. Today we are in part three of a series called Anchored. What we're doing is we're looking at the truth, that there are storms in our lives. Some of them we can plan for, some of them we can't. As a nation, we just went through a political storm where it felt like anxiety and anger and division just continued to rise week after week. And whatever storm that we find ourselves in, we can take hope and find assurance in the fact that God offers for us to come to him And God is the anchor that we can rely on no matter what storms come our way. In God's word, there was this story of a a king. His name is King David, and he existed a long time ago. He led God's people, and he was a great king. And he went through a lot of battles, some of them within his own family. And during that time, he wrote this psalm about some of the storms that he was walking through. Psalm 62 says this, I wait quietly before God. For my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. So many enemies against one man and all of them trying to kill me. To them, I'm just a broken down wall or a tottering fence. They plan to topple me from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but curse me in their hearts. Interlude. Now, in the Hebrew, that word was selah, or sila, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And the biblical scholars believe that that interlude was just a moment given to the reader or the listener to pause and reflect what was just written about or said. And in this occurrence, what David was saying is that he was under attack. People were lying about him. People were seeking to destroy his life. And he was looking for an answer, for an anchor in that storm. And then we hear where his anchor is, starting in verse 5. Let all that I am wait quietly before God. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him for God is our refuge. Then it ends with that interlude again to pause and reflect. When David's life was at risk of being ended. What did he do? He turned to God. And God is the salvation that we seek. He is a rock where we can firmly plant our feet on. He is the victory that we long for. He is our refuge when the storms come. Again, sometimes we can plan a little bit for the storms and sometimes they just hit us unaware. A few months ago, Rachel, my wife, and our three boys, Ezra, he's six, Joel, he's four, and Kai, he's one, but at the time he was 11 months old. We went on vacation to the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, and it was an awesome time. We, we really enjoyed being in the Smoky Mountains, and on Wednesday of that week, I wanted to go to the national park there, and so Smoky Mountains National Park, I was really excited. I like going hiking in the woods. I don't really like like traversing like 
big rocks or whatever. I just like to walk in the woods, kind of at a slow place, just enjoying God's creation. So I thought, this will be a good family activity. So we drove, we got there, and when we parked, we looked up, and the sky was kind of overcast. Now, here's the thing about me. I don't really look at the weather app on my phone. I know that it's mostly wrong, and so I don't want to be disappointed in those regards, so I just don't really pay attention to it. So I showed up that day, looked up, and went, ooh, this might go poorly. But hey, we're here. Why not? So we grabbed some raincoats. We got our best off-roading stroller for Kai, and we got a map. I found out on that map where a waterfall was. I thought, man, it'd be cool to go find a waterfall. And then we started on this trail. About 30 minutes in, the trail got a little too tricky for the stroller, so we abandoned it to the side, figuring like, who's going to steal a stroller, right? Like, who's going to take one of those? And if you did, either I guess you really needed it or how dare you. And so we just put it to the side, picked up Kai, and started walking. But at that same time, something happened to Joel. He was lagging behind, and we turned around and said, Joel, what's going on? And he told us that his legs no longer worked. Now... If you don't have kids, I got to tell you something. There is a very real, and at the same time, not real at all, uh, disease that sometimes comes over kids where their legs go boneless and they just stop being able to move. And so, unfortunately, I, I moved Kai over to Rachel and I grabbed our 30 pound son and I said, All right, we're going to keep going. We've got about a half an hour to go. Let's keep walking. So we walked for a while. We went down this hill. We went under this nice little bridge. Then we went up this stone staircase. And finally, we showed up at this waterfall. And Ezra and Joel looked at it and said, is that it? And we went, come on, guys. It's a waterfall. It's like coming down. Like this water falling from rocks. It's pretty cool. And at that moment, the skies opened up. There was thunder, there was lightning, and there was this torrential downpour that just came upon us. Now, we like the rain. I mean, we're pretty used to it here in Western PA. It rains a lot, but this wasn't like the rain where we send our kids out and just say, go play and have fun, put on your rain boots and jump around in puddles. This was a torrential downpour where the rain hurt when it hit you. It's like these big raindrops and they smacked you. And of course, everyone went into panic mode. So I scooped up Kai. We did get a picture beforehand, which is nice. And then we started running back. And then I remembered Joel's legs don't work. So I went back and I scooped him up as well. So both kids and we ran and we ran ran down those staircases. And then we got to that bridge and we figured we'll just stop here. There was an older couple there, but it was a nice place. It was a refuge from the storm. It was still raging outside of us. But in that moment, we weren't dry, mind you, but we were not getting rained on. And we were able to stand there for a bit, just enjoying the cover that we had amidst the danger that was outside That's what God offers for us. He tells us there is going to be storms. There's going to be troubles in this life. Sometimes we can plan for them. Sometimes we won't. But he always knows what's about to happen. And in those times, he tells us to come to him, to anchor ourselves in him so that when the storms do come, we won't be destroyed. Our families won't be destroyed. And our neighborhoods and our nations won't topple because we are grounded in our firm foundation of God. Throughout this series, we've been looking at how do we do that? How do we anchor ourselves to the living God? And what we've been using is one single verse. And it was written by the disciple John, and it's about something that Jesus said. And so Jesus told him, talking to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Each message in this series, what we've simply done has taken a portion of that and described what was Jesus talking about. So week one, we talked about how Jesus is the way. And if you missed any of our messages and you want to check them out, you could do that on on the app or on the website or on a YouTube channel. We have looked at Jesus talking about living the way that he lived. And so we can live the way that Jesus lived by speaking with our Heavenly Father and by loving people with the radical love that Jesus has for us. Then Pastor Sam last week did a great job talking about the truth of Jesus and how when we are anchored in Jesus' truth, we will share that truth in love. And today, we're going to talk about being anchored in the life. Jesus said he is the life. And it's important to know that the word that was used there was the Greek word zoe. And the word for life was, well, there's two words for life, bios, which meant just the physical life that we have, which is like the heart pumping kind of life. And then there was zoe, which was the spiritual supernatural life. And that's the word that was used here. It's the life that God possesses. It's the life that God created Adam and Eve to dwell in when they first came to this planet before sin entered into our world. 
It's the kind of life that Jesus lived, a supernatural spiritual life connected with the Father. And it's also the life that Jesus won for you and me on the cross. He won that for us with his life, death, and resurrection. And now he offers Zoe spiritual, supernatural life right here and now. Not just when we die and we go to heaven, but right now he's given us the opportunity to receive this Zoe life, this ability to live with God, to walk and talk and to see his miracles on this earth. He simply just asks us to give our lives over. And when we do that, we are born again. We're born new. This is how Jesus describes it. There was one time where there was a Pharisee, his name is Nicodemus. He came to Jesus in the darkness of night. And that's important to know because a lot of the Pharisees hated Jesus. They didn't like the fact that he was claiming to be one with God, that he was claiming to be God. And so they tried to trip him up and trap him, eventually worked to get him killed. But Nicodemus kept seeing what Jesus was doing and thought, man, this guy is up to something. Like, I really do believe he's God. And so in the evening, when all his Pharisee friends couldn't see him, he went to talk to Jesus. And this is the conversation they had. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you, which again is a, a tremendous statement of faith given by a Pharisee. Again, most of the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. Anyway, continue. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? Exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Fair question, Nicodemus. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. So Nicodemus' confusion makes sense. How can we be born again? But Jesus is talking about a different sort of being born. He's saying, you're born physically, but I want you to be born spiritually because that's how we were created to live, one with God on this earth. And when we are born again, it's not just that we act a little nicer or we're a little more morally good, although those things are byproducts of it. What Jesus is saying is that we are brand new. Eight years ago, Rachel and I bought our house. And when we bought it, we looked at the bathroom upstairs and we said, oh man, we got to get this fixed up. It's an old bathroom. We want a new bathroom. And eight years later now, we are finally uh, getting it fixed up. And one of the things that happened in the intermediate time is we would clean it up to make it look nicer, but it was always still the same old bathroom. No matter how many times you scrubbed it or shined it, it was still old. In our lives, we think a lot of times of coming to Jesus just like he scrubs us clean. Now, God's word does tell us he makes us white as snow. He makes us clean is what that that verse means. He does take away our sins, but Jesus is talking about a whole remodel. And so this year, we had some people we hired to come in, and they, on the first day, demolished the whole bathroom, which must have been fun. They took out the tub and the, the toilet and the sink and everything, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, all that stuff was just ripped up. And I remember standing in there being like, wow, this is amazing. Like, there was a bathroom here, and there is no bathroom now. And then they started to put stuff in. It became a new bathroom. And that's what Jesus wants to do with our lives. He wants to come in and take everything in our lives that is not of him and remove it so that this Zoe, this new, this supernatural spiritual life could be in us, can be in us, so that we can live with God on this earth right now. And everything that we're talking about today is about how do we receive this life and how do we live in it? And what does our lives look like when we do live this spiritual supernatural life like Jesus? And to sum up what we're gonna be talking about and what we have talked about is our take home point. And it says this, when we're born again, we become anchored in Jesus' life, living as he lived. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came to this earth to give us the opportunity to live with God, again, not just in heaven, but right now and forever. This is what he was talking to Nicodemus about. And even later on in this conversation with Nicodemus, he gave, Jesus gave Nicodemus his mission statement for why he was here on this earth. And it was in verse 16 of chapter three. And you might've heard this verse before. It's one of the more famous ones, but Jesus, he says this in this conversation. He says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Once again, that word life there is zoe, the supernatural spiritual life. Jesus says this is why he came, to die and to rise again so that we could receive this gift. 
And so when we receive it, we get this opportunity to live like Jesus. And how do we learn how to do that? Well, we must become Jesus' disciple. Another word for disciple is apprentice. We must learn how Jesus lived so that we can live in the same fashion. There's this wonderful book called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And now with all of the books that we reference that aren't the Bible, it's not, it, these aren't perfect resources, but I really think that John Mark Comer does a great job of helping us in this day and age understand how does God's word impact our lives right now. And he said this regarding Jesus' invitation. Jesus' invitation was not to convert to a new religion called Christianity, but to apprentice under him into life in the kingdom of God of God. We get to apprentice under the master. One of the greatest gifts if you are an apprentice of a master is you just get to invest a lot of time with someone who knows a craft that you want to learn. When I was studying ministry, I got to invest a lot of time learning underneath different pastors that had different skills. I chose them strategically. Okay, you're really good at this. You're really good at this. Let me just learn and hang out. And one of the best gifts they gave me was just allowing me to shadow them and walk through life with them. And I got to ask them questions and see how they operated. And Jesus gives us that very same opportunity where we get to shadow and walk through life with him to learn how he lived so we can live that same way. You see, the blessing of being anchored in the life of Jesus is simply Jesus. The blessing of being anchored in Jesus is Jesus. There will be other blessings that come along There'll be answered prayers and there'll be supernatural miracles that happen. Those are byproducts of being with Jesus. But the greatest blessing that we could ever have is simply being with Jesus, being with the rabbi, learning from him. And that's what a disciple did. They would literally sit at the feet of a a rabbi and just learn and listen and then walk with them and watch so that they could do what the rabbi did. And we get this blessing of just being with Jesus. In the 14th century, there was this philosopher, and I'm sure I'm going to mess up this name. The name was Callistos Catafigiatis, or something like that. I'm sure that was right. Um, it sounds kind of like the disease that Joel had on his legs. Um, Catafigiatis. Um, and Callistos, double K, said this, the most important thing that happens between God and the human soul is to love and to be loved. It's to love and to be loved. Again, we can get wrapped up in the other benefits and blessings of being with Jesus, but we get a relationship with the God of the universe. We love, and he loves us. That is the blessing. In the 18th century, there was this priest, and this priest witnessed an elderly peasant day after day come into the church and simply sit there in silence. Eventually, this priest went to the elderly peasant and asked, what are you doing here? Like, what would you say you're doing? Just kind of like sitting here in the silence. And this is what the peasant responded with. I look at him meeting God. He looks at me and we are happy. I look at him, he looks at me and we are happy. Some people have called that love loving, simply love loving. You love God and he loves you. And I know that sounds too simple to our minds. Like that doesn't sound like activity, but think about it. If there's someone that you love and you're just maybe on a walk one day, Maybe in the fall where the trees have just turned and it's beautiful weather, you could have worn a hoodie or shorts, whatever you want to do. It's just the perfect weather and you're just walking with them in God's creation. You don't have to say anything. You're just there. They're in your presence, someone that you love, and you're just with them. And that's what that person was saying. That We get that gift of just being with the Heavenly Father, the God of the universe, and Jesus We actually see this lived out in God's word. In Luke chapter 10, it says this, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Again, that's what a disciple did. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair for you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Mary got it. She knew what was most important. She was sitting with Jesus. Over the last several years, I've adopted the habit of waking up in the morning and going right into a time of prayer with God. But I gotta be honest with you. When I first started it, I fought this temptation of embarrassment. See, I'd be downstairs on the couch and I would start 
praying. And then when someone would come down, whether it was my wife or the kids, I would feel like, oh, am I not doing anything? Does it just look like I'm staring at a wall? Sometimes in my office, that would happen too. Like before I go and write a message or before I go to a meeting, I pray because I know that I'm not at my best if I'm not praying because I want God to use me in whatever way he wants to use me. And so I invest time in the office praying. And then when someone comes in, what would happen is I would hear their footsteps and then I'd quickly grab a book um, to make it look like I was doing something. Like, see, I was reading, I was doing something. And I got convicted of this. God was like, what are you doing? Why are you embarrassed about being with me? And I learned this, investing time with God is the most important investment we can make with our time on earth. It's the most important investment. I've wasted a lot of time in my life. I'll just be honest. There's been times where I'm watching TV shows and I press next episode and the next episode. And yes, I'm still watching next episode. And then I'm like, wait, I don't even like this show. Like, what am I doing here? Like, why are we streaming this show still? Or I'll be reading a book and I love reading books, but like there'll be a point where I'm like, man, I don't really enjoy this book, but I only have like a hundred pages left. It'd be cool to kind of say that I finished this. And so I'll power through the last hundred pages just to say I read it. And I go, that was kind of a waste of time. Or maybe you're on social media and you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and you get done with it and you're like, hmm, that wasn't a good use of my time. But here's the thing. Every time I've invested time with prayer, every time, no matter if it's been a couple minutes or it's been an hour or whatever, it's never felt like a waste. It's always been an investment because I always get to invest that time with the God of the universe. And so let us look at our time and prioritize investing it with the God of the universe who wants to just be with us. And here's a blessing. When we invest time with God, this happens. Investing time with Jesus will help us live like Jesus. So we're talking about the Zoe life, the supernatural, the spiritual life, the life that Jesus lived. We are given that as a gift when we give our lives over to Jesus and we're born again. When we're anchored in the life of Jesus, we get to live like him. And the more we invest time with Jesus, the more we're going to learn about how we lived and we can live the same way. And how did Jesus live? Well, Jesus loved the less than, the downtrodden, and the unlovable. He shared truth and love and supernaturally impacted this world. That's who Jesus is. That's what, he, that's rather, that's what he did. And so to end our time together, what we're simply going to do is walk through those three things. He loved the unlovable. He shared his life with other people, and he lived supernaturally. So let's walk through that. First, he loved the unlovable. There was this one story, and it's an amazing encounter. Jesus was walking, and he saw this tax collector. Now, tax collectors were hated in their day. Why? Because they worked for the Roman Empire, and they stole more money than they had to. And so they were the oppressors. They worked for the oppressors. And so one day, Jesus is walking, and he saw this tax collector, Zacchaeus, who people hated. And he said, I want to eat at your house today. Now, sometimes when we hear that, we might have our hearts warmed by that and think, oh, that's really nice of Jesus. Like, that'd be like at the lunch table where someone always sits by themselves and then Jesus walks over and sits with them. That's a nice thing to do, but we got to understand, it would have been almost offensive in those days. It would have been like if Jesus went into Poland during World War II and invited himself over to a Nazi informer's house to have a meal. He would have looked and said, what are you doing? Like, why are you going there? But Jesus went. And when he went there, he actually acted more like host than guest. It wasn't even his house, but he came to share his life and the love of the father with Zacchaeus. And through their encounter, Zacchaeus gave his life over to God and became a disciple of Jesus. And when we look at that, we can live the same way. You see, Jesus shared his life and love with those around him, and so can we. It doesn't necessarily matter if someone's at our house or if we're at their house or if we're meeting at Starbucks, but we can live the same way Jesus did. We can invest our life with people by investing the love and life of Jesus everywhere we go with every encounter we have. Whether we're in a meeting, whether we're at a Thanksgiving meal, whatever it is, we can share the same love of Jesus with other people. How do we do that? Well, it's not just hanging out, mind you. It's not just like being friendly with someone. When Jesus was with someone, he cared more about them than he cared about anything else. And so we can ask ourselves some questions. Am I talking more than I'm listening? Am I sharing more about my own problems or am I asking questions? Am I caring for the person that I'm talking to right now? When opportunities to pray arise, am I taking those opportunities? Am I stopping and saying, ooh, why don't we pray about this? I believe God wants to help you with this. Are we pointing to God with our words and our actions? Are we looking at 
our encounters with everyone as opportunities to share the life and love of Jesus with them. That's what Jesus did, and we can do that as well when we have this Zoe life, when we're anchored in the life of Jesus. So let us share our lives with other people. What else did Jesus do? Well, Jesus shared the truth in love about God with others, and so can we. Pastor Sam did a great job of talking about what that meant last week. But Jesus, when he went around, he shared about his heavenly father. He talked about God with people. It always came up in conversation. That makes sense because Jesus has a tight-knit relationship with his heavenly father. And so he talked about him. In my life, I love my family, so I talk about them. I've talked about them already a couple times today. A few weeks ago, I was in Cambodia on a mission trip away from my family, and I got word from Rachel that Kai took his first steps, and I also heard that Ezra lost his first tooth. I was kind of devastated. But what I did is I went and I shared about that with the people I was with, whether they wanted to hear about it or not. I shared in some pictures and videos and said, look at Kai walk and then fall. Watch it again. It was pretty cool. And I shared about them. And what happened when I did that? Well, I felt closer to my family and I got to share the love I had for my family with other people. There was this missionary named Frank Laubach and he said this, I must talk about God or I cannot keep him in my mind. I must give him away in order to have him. The more we talk about God, the more we're going to experience his presence with us. There's a beautiful blessing about that. I talked to a man after service, this this last service, and he talked about being healed supernaturally by God. And he said every time he talks about that story, he feels this closeness with the God of the universe. So we share about God. We don't do it obnoxiously. We're not pushing God down people's throats, but we just talk about our love relationship with the God of the universe. That's what Jesus did. How else did Jesus live? Well, Jesus lived supernaturally, and so can we. Now, the, the other stuff, loving people and being kind to people and stuff like that, we, we generally, okay, we agree, we see Jesus doing that, and we can do that. The supernatural stuff, there's sometimes we have some doubt in our minds about that because we're human. A few months ago, we had this message series called Who's the Boss? And in that series, in part four of that series, we talked about how Jesus gives us his authority on this earth to bring about his kingdom to earth. The message is called Authority in the Kingdom. And in that message, we talked about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the same things Jesus did. So Jesus, through us, can bring about his healing and his deliverance and his prophecy in this world in the here and now. And we shared real stories from right now where that is going on. And I tell you about that because I just want to point you to that message. On the back of your physical outline, if you grabbed one on your way in today, there's a little QR code. And I encourage you to scan that. It brings you to our One Church app. And in there's all of our past messages. If you have the app, you could always just go to the, the message button and then find it there, or you can go on the website, the link's there too. If you didn't grab one on your way out, you can always just go to our website and find it that way, newlifexn.org, or just Google New Life Christian Ministries. And during that message, we talked at length, how do we live this supernatural life? So I would encourage you, if you weren't there, if you want a reminder to go check that out. But today, I just simply want to share with you a miracle that I got to witness recently. So... Once again, we as a family were in the Smoky Mountains and we were under that bridge and it was storming and it wasn't letting up and we were trying to figure out what do we do with these three kids that don't really want to walk through this downpour. And then I had an idea. We were just talking about who's the boss and I remember hearing about how Jesus allows us to live the same way that he lives and I thought, okay, well, what would Jesus do in this moment? Well, Jesus, when he was caught in a storm, he prayed that storm away. I thought, why don't we give it a try? And so I went outside the bridge and I declared in the name of Jesus the authority that he's given us. And I claim that authority and the help that comes from the Holy Spirit. And I asked God, and I would like to say as bold as I possibly could, but I probably asked God so that I could be heard only by myself, that he would remove that storm. That in the name of Jesus, that the storm would cease and move and we could go on dry land, well, I mean, wet, soggy land, but on the way back to our cars. And then I thought, okay, If I believe in this, what I got to do is just start going and not wait for the rain to stop. So I turned to my family and I said, let's go. And I picked up Joel and we started walking. And as soon as we got out of that bridge, I got to tell you, the storm stopped. And it was just like drizzling just a little bit until it finally finished. And I got to be honest, I was kind of shocked, almost so shocked that I've kept that in the back of my head, but I haven't shared it before. Now, I, uh, after last service, I asked Gabe if he could put a picture uh, up about the, the post storm. So do we have that here? 
So, okay, so we are, you can see Joel's face right there. He is pleased. So we got back to the stroller. It wasn't stolen, mind you, um, but it was drenched. So we dumped it out and we put Joel in it because again, the legs, you could see, they're not working. And behind us though, I thought it was a great evidence of like, we were walking and there was no rain before. And we got back and there's a humongous puddle because of that crazy storm. But we got out fine and the rain had stopped. Again, now I hesitate to tell you that story because I know what I would be thinking hearing that. Like, okay, wasn't it just a coincidence? Like, okay, you prayed that, but like, was the rain just going to stop immediately, like suddenly anyway in that moment? And I've had those same thoughts too. But then I started to reflect on different times I've had in the past. A few years ago, before the galaxy was built, and that's uh, that, the part of the building that has the children's ministry going on right now. Before that, when we ran at youth group, we had so many small groups with our youth groups that we didn't have enough rooms for everyone. In the summers, we would gather with our senior high and junior high together. And after every message, we broke them up into small groups that were divided by age and gender. So all the sixth grade boys go together, all the seventh grade girls go together, but we didn't have enough rooms. And so we figured for the summer, what we're going to do is just send them outside. And we thought, well, what if it rains in the summer in Western PA? Like, what would we do then? And we thought, I don't know. We can't just make new rooms. So why don't we just pray every single week that God would remove the rain and that we would have dry outside so that people can go. And for every week, for two years, until that building was built, it never rained and we were able to meet outside. Now I hear that and I experience that. I go, hey, of course that's God working. Like God is the only one that can do that. But sometimes I doubt the miraculous other stuff. But here's how I know that this is really God working. July 3rd, something else happened. July 3rd, we were getting ready for the fireworks. We were on the fairgrounds. We had everything set up. All the vendors were there. We were getting ready to light the fireworks for the community. It's one of the ways that we show the love of Jesus to our community. There's no fireworks here in Saxonburg before we started putting them on. So we were like, let's just love our community in this way and do that. And so we get to do that every year. And we also get opportunities for people who love Jesus to build relationships with those who don't know Jesus. It's a great thing all around. But when we get there, our family sets up our chairs, all that stuff. Gabe, our worship director, came over to me with a picture of the radar. Now, again, I hadn't looked at the weather app or anything like that, so I had no idea what was about to happen. But I looked up and I was like, oh yeah, it looks kind of gloomy up there. And I could hear like the rumble of thunder coming not too far away. And he showed me this radar and it said that it was going to thunder and lightning and downpour right where we were in about a half an hour. And he asked me, what do we do? Now, this is my first fireworks as our lead pastor. And he said, do you want to move it forward? Do you want to move it back? Like, what do we do with the people here? And I answered, I don't know. I don't know. What am I supposed to do? Like, build a tent? Like, what are we doing here? And so I said, okay, why don't we, why don't we pray? And so my mind flashed back to the Smoky Mountains of like, okay, God did that. I know God did that. So why don't we ask him again? And so this time more bold, I'm telling you, the second time easier to to be bold with it. So I asked in the name of Jesus that he would remove the storm, that he would make it go past us so we could do this for God's kingdom so we can continue the work that he has us being about. And so we claim the authority that Jesus gives us. We commanded the storm to go. And then we looked at each other and said, all right, I think we're good. Let's just uh, go as business as usual. And I got to tell you, the storm passed by and we went business as usual and everything went off well that night. And God responded because that's what he does. He still responds today. He's still healing people today. He's still speaking prophecies today. He's still moving because he's the same God. And Jesus told us that when we receive the gift of Jesus' life, we are born again into the supernatural spiritual life and we can live like Jesus. And when we're anchored in the life of Jesus, we'll see his miracles abound, not because of us, but because of him. Jesus actually said this to his disciples. After he talked about being the way, the truth, and the life, he told us this. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Think about that. The same works Jesus did and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Why is that important? Well, Jesus as a human could be in one place, but he left to go to heaven with his heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit came And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and it fills all those who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior all over the world. And now, with the ability of the Holy Spirit, we can live like Jesus. In God's Word, it tells us about this guy named Elijah who once prayed and the rain stopped, and then he prayed again and the rain came. And the Bible says that that Elijah was a normal guy just like us. But what was different? Well, he knew God. He had an intimate relationship with God, and we can have an intimate relationship with the God of the universe as well. So this week, let us live with Jesus. Let us invest time being with him. 
Let us look at him and allow him to look at us and be happy in the love that God has for you and me. Let us carve out time to do that. It's never a waste of time. Let us also live like Jesus with the people around us. Let us be more host than guests. Let us treat people how Jesus treats us by caring about others that we're interacting with, no matter where we are. Let's also share about God. Let's not be afraid to share about God. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to use us to, to tell people about our relationship with the God of the universe. And also, let us go and ask God for big things, miraculous, supernatural things that are available to us here and now. And we can live all of that out through today's next step, which says, I will anchor myself in the life of Jesus by investing time in his presence and living as he lived. And as we do that, we'll be able to watch as God transforms our life into something brand new and as he transforms the lives around us, the communities we're in, our nation, and ultimately our world, because that's who our God is. If you're here today and you're hearing all this stuff and you're saying, maybe I've been to a church before, maybe I've never been to a church before, but as you're talking about it, you have the same questions that Nicodemus had. How do we get born again? How do we receive this Zoe life? Zoe life? Even if you're thinking like, I don't understand all this stuff, but I want that anchor in the storm. I want that firm foundation. Well, here at New Life, we say the process to receiving that is actually pretty simple. It's as simple as A, B, and C. A starts with admitting. We admit who we are and who he is. We admit that we're sinners, which simply means we miss the mark. We're not perfect. God calls us to perfection like God is, but we don't always hit that. So we admit that. And we also admit that Jesus is our savior, who is a rescuer from sin and death. And we believe. We believe in Jesus as Lord. And Lord means God, owner, master. And we also believe in him as that savior. And then we confess not only our sins, but our need for Jesus as Lord and savior. And then we commit to living this life through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's spirit living on earth right now, filling everyone who believes in Jesus and gives their lives over so that we can receive that Zoe life and live like him. Right now, what we're gonna do is gonna invest a little time in prayer. It's always an investment. And if you do know Jesus as Lord and Savior and you're here right now, I'd encourage you to pray for someone in your life that doesn't yet know Jesus. Maybe in the room, maybe near you right now. Maybe you don't even know their name, but you're praying for them. Or maybe outside this room, someone that you care for that's heavy on your heart, pray for them. But if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior and you'd like to today, I'd encourage you to make this choice to receive this new life. It's brand new. It's not just cleaned up. It's brand new where we get to live and exist with God on this planet right now and eternity forever. What we're going to do is I'm going to pray as if I were you. Trusting in Jesus for the very first time, I'm going to pray out loud, asking God to come into my life. And I encourage you to use those same words or to use your own. Really what the important thing is, is transferring ownership over to the God of the universe and receiving his free gift of everlasting life that starts now and forever. Would you please pray with me? Dear God, I believe you are the one true God. I believe Jesus, your son, came, died, and rose again for me. Please forgive me of my sins. Make me new. Give me this spiritual life, a supernatural life. Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. And Holy Spirit, fill me, work through me now and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And dear God, for all of us, Holy Spirit, please help us to live like Jesus. Help us invest time where we're just with you. I know there's so many things on our schedules. It's so easy to get busy, God. And I pray that you will help us, give us the strength and the patience to carve out time just to be in your presence and to be at your feet and to learn about you and how you lived, God, and transform our lives. Help us when we're with other people to remember to care about them more than ourselves. Help us to have the strength and the courage to talk about you just to share about how you love us so that other people can experience that as well. God, and I pray that as we ask you for supernatural big things this week, that you will open our eyes to see your miracles this week. The fact that you're still moving and answering prayers, God, give us, give us that evidence. Help us to build our faith, make us steadfast in you. We love you. We thank you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.